Hello, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay? Today, basically, I'm going to talk about uh, a problem that we've all faced as data scientists. We're always trying to decide, um, actually, in general, uh, what's better when we're designing a model or we're choosing a pre-trained network or whatever we happen to be doing. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm talking about this, I should give you a little background. I'm actually not a statistician, even though that's my title. Uh, I studied computational neuroscience, and uh, I'm only in the industry for a couple of years now. And so I just happened to notice there's this pattern uh, that keeps repeating everywhere I go, and it, it led me to a little confusion. So first, um, my name is Noah, but I don't have animals or arcs or anything like it, so we can skip the jokes. Uh, we have two main data science offices at Wix. We're a pretty big uh, division, but we're relatively new and always growing. Um, so basically, this is what I saw. I started to look at papers, and uh, I noticed they tend to end in a very similar way, right? Uh, they tend to end with our network is better than the other guys, right? Like we, we, we compared it on some enormous test set, some industry standard, which we're all together overfitting to. Um, <laughs> And as a giant uh, organization. Um, yeah, so we're all comparing these test sets, right? And we, we built these neural networks. I don't like, let's just call them bags of linear algebra. As a computational neuroscientist, calling them neural networks is just offensive. But uh, OK, so these bags of linear algebra, and that whose entire concept, entire philosophy is statistical inference, right? We're trying to guess something based on historical knowledge about something that we don't yet know. And we made it all the way to the end. We trained on this huge data set, and we thought about data augmentation, and we thought about all sorts of network architectures, and we came up with all these really cool concepts to get us to some result. And then we decide which one is better based on a point estimate, a number, right? Like we get some tests, we, we compare on some test set, and we said, oh, look at this one here. This is actually no algorithm, right? And we look at the precision, and we say, okay, now it all got 0.834 as it's you know, it's this, if you're happy with this loss function, fine. We got 0.834, and uh, if you don't do anything really, uh, you get 0.821. I don't know, is 0.834 higher than 0.821? I mean, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a single number. It's very hard to make any more statistical inferences from a single number. But we just built this entire neural network, an entire bag of the neural network. We trained for, for days, and we collected all this data, and we had labels, and we had all this stuff, and in the end, we're happy with saying, yeah, 0.834, that's the highest. It's fine. So we did the same thing here. Look, oh, this guy's algorithm is uh, uh, the recall is the best, yeah, 0.742. And overall, the F1 score is definitely the best. And considering it's dependent on the precision and recall, that's not very surprising. Um, so yeah, definitely 0.704 is definitely better than 0.691. We're happy we can now choose uh, which network we're going to start with. So we end up sometimes when we're just trying to choose. Oh, this thing is very uh, directional. So. Um, so we're trying to choose now which one is better. So if you would, if you were the paper's authors, you'd obviously select your favorite one, the one you worked a lot of time on. Which one is better? Uh, so the authors would like you to believe that their one is better because that's the highest number that came out. They have some good excuses though. Look, training takes a long time. It's a big neural network. It's got a lot of hidden layers. And what are we going to do? Our data set is huge. We got tons of images in our data set. Yeah. So I mean. Nothing we could do. We can't like bootstrap it or, or, or run some cross validation. It would take us a year to get the end of our results. So what can you do? Let's take the point estimate. That's fine. So this is my has been my experience in the last years. I don't know. Have you guys kind of felt the same way that you did all this work and you got to this point and then you ended up with a single number and you're like, hmm, okay. And you went to your boss and you're like, yeah, my precision is better than the other guy's precision. I'm not really sure if always, but at least you know on the test set that I tried, it looks the best. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a problem that we've had. So is choosing the top score better per se? That's one. And uh, there's another issue that we have. Even if we can do kind of nice, fancy stuff or a general classification problem, well, we chose a couple of architectures. Or we chose a couple different approaches. I used uh, XGB, and this one used SVM. And or I used this neural network architecture, and the other guy used another, or whatever, or even just me. And in the end, I want to know which one is best. And generally, what do we all do, right? We, we chose three different algorithms, and we choose the one that came out with the highest number on the test set that we randomly selected, right? So we did all this work in statistical inference. And then the last final tiny step at the very end of all the work, 
we just chose the highest one. So let's just do, I call that first chapter forgetting statistics, right? Because we worked all that way and then we forgot statistics. So I just wanted to do a little thought experiment with you all just to kind of show you why it's actually not always a good idea to choose just the top one. So here's my thought experiment. Uh, that's my four-month-old, this was when he was younger, but my four-month-old uh, uh, baby, who, by the way, decided to wake up every single hour last night. So I'm sorry in advance if I'm like rambling or saying nonsense. Um, fortunately, it's not very hard to tell when he's happy or sad because he makes very expressive faces, like the one he made at me at 3 a.m. He's extremely happy to be awake. Uh, you didn't need a very strong classifier to figure out my expression on it. <laughs> But he was very happy. So we're going to just uh, classify my, my son's emotions, OK? But we're not going to use your fancy neural network. No, we're just going to use two coins. So I have a bronze coin, and I have a silver coin, and I have 100 pictures, sometimes when he's happy, sometimes when he's sad, right? And we're going to use the coins to classify my son's emotions, OK? So let's look at our first model, model number one, the bronze coin. So like I showed you here, right, in this particular 100 throws, it got 53 heads and 47 tails. And uh, as you can see, this is the reality. I got 27 heads. Uh, let's assign heads to be uh, uh, sad, right? So I got 27 uh, uh, true sads. And uh, well, 26 times, let's not talk about those. And uh, for tails, same, these are happy. So I got you know, 24 true happies. Uh, and the other ones, let's not talk about. So I have a second model, though. I have a gold coin. And, uh, oh, I want to tell you in advance, these are, these are fair coins, yeah. Um, but uh, in this case, yeah, I threw it 100 times, uh, and I got 24 and 25 and 26 and 25. And let's just do a quick little calculation here. Let's think about the precision in the recall. Um, for Model 1, our precision was 51. Well, it's like 5% better than, than Model 2. And our recall, I, sorry, our precision was 51, and our recall was 54 versus 48, like a huge improvement, much bigger than 0.821 versus 0.834, right? Um, and by the way, nicely showing you here, the F1 is 53, which if anyone hasn't been thinking too long about F scores, right? So which coin makes the better classifier? Easy choice, let's choose the highest, right? Definitely the bronze coin. Let's go with the bronze coin. Right? Everyone's satisfied. It's a great model. The bronze coin is definitely better than the silver one. So a bad method. Clearly, the current method of selecting the top score leads us to absurd results. Right? That's my basic point. And a better method would tell you what is obvious in this case, that with 100 pictures of my son happy and sad, the coins are indistinguishable. Right? And that then we would go and make a logical choice. People had a good excuse, though, right? Like I mentioned. We can't bootstrap, we can't cross-validate, we can't do any of those tricks on our training set. Our training set is huge, and our training takes a long time. So let me give you a proposed solution. What's a proposed solution? What should it do? What, what would you want in a good solution? A good solution first, well, it should give you some kind of hint about how the model is going to be performing. Right? Now, a test set, what you hope when you take a test set is it exactly represents the kind of classes that you're going to see in real life. Right? But you took one subsample. Right? Okay. So a good, a good, some good solution should be able to give you some indication how well your model is going to perform. What else? Well, it should help you to tell models apart, right? If one is actually different than the other, and if it is, which one's the best one, right? Or one minus which is the worst one. Um, and then even better, well, your test set was just a subsample. So what I'd really like to know is, well, how likely are my classes going to, my class balance is going to change, yeah? So if I'm very confident, I know there's actually 10 times as many dogs as there are cats, and I have a dog and cat classifier, fine, I can be happy with that. But you might also have a situation where, you know, I'm not sure whether it's always exactly 10 to 1. And so I don't want to know what my model is going to do if the test set exactly replicates the reality. I also want to know what happens if the test set is not a perfect representation of exactly what I'm going to see in real life. Right. Basically, the probability of a class appearing in your test set is also a random variable. Okay? So, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of a solution. It doesn't solve every single problem because it's a 25-minute talk. Plus, I didn't think about it all the way to the end. But, but it's going to give us at least a start to show that the excuse of we can't cross-validate because our training set is too big is, is a lousy excuse. We, we can still do some stuff. Okay? So, first, we have this nice large training set. So if we're in a classical classification or aggression problem, right, what we can simply do is we take our different features, for example, this one, 
And we discover that for each class, it has a certain variance, right? And this variance has a certain, uh, you know, we, we can select this, uh, uh, we, we, from this variance, we can construct basically a, a distribution with a zero mean that has the variance that we found in our, in our, in our training set, right? And we can do this for all of our classes. Uh, and then uh, let's say take the, just let's say for a simple solution, take the average variance between the classes. But if we're on a neural network problem, we have to do a little bit more work. Why? Because we can't just, for example, take the random distribution of, let's say, the input weights or something like that, because then you're starting to go back and you know, mess around with the algorithm in its first place, and we don't want to do that. By the way, everything I'm about to tell you is what happens when we have already a trained system. I'm not talking here about data augmentation or any of these other things, okay? Um, so anyway, we have this thing. So if you, let's say we were in the case of, my, uh, of where we're trying to decide whether my son is happy or sad, uh, in this case, we have faces, right? So we might have faces that come in with different angles, right? So instead of looking at the variance of, let's say, I don't know, single pixel values or things that are kind of uh, very low level, we might want to look at variances of more higher order things that actually would impact the results of our model. So in this case, for example, if his head is tilted this way or that way, maybe we can, there is some impact on the success of detecting whether he's happy or sad, because, you know, a frown is pointing down and this is pointing that unless his head is upside down. Right? So then what we might do is say, okay, well, what, are the, what is the distribution of angles that we actually have in our uh, face angles that we actually have in our training set? And we can say, okay, well, if our training set is representative of the world, of course, if our training set isn't representative of the world, our model is going to suck anyway, so there's no point in to worry about it. So if our training set is representative of what we're going to see in the world, so we can take now this distribution of angles, this variance in the angles, and create again a distribution that has zero mean and uh, uh, a variance that is equal to that of my model. So, and we would do that then for a lot of different higher order parameters, right? So it takes a little extra work for a neural network, but it takes, uh, uh, and it takes a lot less work for a, for a standard class. Uh, I should also mention, if you, have, if you have categorical variables, there's also ways to do it. What you could do is, one, one simple solution is you one hot encode, and then you look at the binomial variance, right? P times one minus P. Okay, so, the next thing I'm offering, I'm, I'm suggesting, is that we subsample our test set. Now, why do we subsample our test set? We subsample our test set because our test set, it's essentially a simulation of what our test set has done to the world, right? We've subsampled the world with our test set, so let's subsample our test set like we're subsampling the world. Okay? Now, on this subsample, let's just add noise. Again, we, add, we created a distribution with zero mean and the variance that arise from our, from our variables, we're gonna add noise. Now, why do we bother to add noise? We bother to add noise because in that particular case where we select randomly, right, a value for the noise that we're gonna add from the distribution that we generated. So here again is the distribution. We have a zero, we added zero, and it has a variance that we found from our training set. And now we add noise by plucking randomly uh, from this distribution and adding it to, to one of our test samples. Now, why is that? Because what are the odds of finding the exact sample that we have in our test set in the real world, right? What is the, what is the probability of a single point on a PDF? Zero, right? And so, obviously, we're not going to find that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take and we're going to add variants that we come to expect from our training set, okay? What's the next step? Well, we classify our noised subsample, okay? And at that point, we can just calculate the average loss, right? And basically, now what am I suggesting? The obvious, we bootstrap. So in every iteration, what do we do? We subsampled our test set. We added noise who, who's corresponding, who corresponds to the noise of our training set, right? And we estimate our bootstrap loss. Now, as soon as we do that, uh, well, first I want to make a quick word. This is PyData, so I should mention a little Python. This is a very simple function, right? All you got to do is add noise and calculate the loss. So what goes in? A trained model a subsample of the test features, a subsample of, let's say, the test ground truth, right? And the feature variance, which we calculated in the way that I described. And what comes out? The mean loss per iteration. And I don't care what loss function you decide on, yeah? So just uh, you take that function, you iterate it, and you're done, yeah? So this is literally a few lines of code. Uh, thanks, Tanya. And uh, uh, we take our trained model, our subsample of our test set, the subsample of our ground truth, and this matrix, the feature variance matrix that we found. In this case, it's very simple. We just add some noise uh, that's based on that variance, right? Uh, this is a random distribution. And now we calculate what our log loss is on the noise, right? And we return that as a function.
Every iteration is due. Uh, what is being transferred from one iteration to the next? Nothing. They're wholly, power, they're wholly independent each iteration. We're subsampling. We're bootstrapping. Yeah, we're just bootstrapping, but we're adding a little extra. In, we're, we're not bootstrapping with replacement. We're bootstrapping subsampling. Yeah. Aren't you overfitting the test set? Well, all right, I'm not talking about train. We can't retrain. So there's no overfitting because the, the, the model's already trained. Now what I'm doing is creating basically, essentially, a histogram of what my errors are. So I, we did this as a simple example. Uh, I just compared random forest, added boost, and logistic regression. I think it was in the iris, uh, iris set. And uh, uh, I found something interesting, right? Well, first of all, if you were looking at a point estimate, this overlap between logistic regression and added boost essentially tells you what are the odds you would have chose logistic regression over added boost, yeah? You can see all this overlapping section. Well, that's the odds, yeah? If you take this, this integral, right, that's the chance that even though you know by now looking at this nice, beautiful histogram that you should definitely choose add a boost because the error is the lowest. Sorry, I should really describe. This is log loss, and these are simply counts. So add a boost has the lowest log loss. Uh, but a lot of the time, you would have chose logistic regression. Also, you discovered another little side benefit here. Notice what happens in, the, in, in add a boost, right? You have some cases, right, where the log loss is suddenly much higher. It's a binomial distribution, okay? Now, to me, what that indicates is because we've added noise, some of our, uh, our features seem to be uh, very sensitive to, to this jitter, which means we probably need to regularize some of them, right? And then we'd improve our results. So even bef not even choosing, we learn something extra about our model. Why should, our, why should we have a bimodal distribution of our error, right? It tells us something is weird going on there with Adaboost. So we got some insight without even the whole question of deciding between. Um, so one, it gives you a hint how your model is actually going to perform, right? Because now it's not just, you don't just come to your boss and say, well, look, I got a, I got a log loss of 0 0.0134. No, you say, well, I can tell you that 90% of the time, the model is going to perform between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 uh, uh, log loss, right? Or accuracy or precision or recall or area under the curve, whatever you want, okay? Uh, what's the other thing? It allows you to tell models apart, right? So now you have two histograms. You can do any hypothesis test that you like, right? You want to see if the medians are different, the means are different, anything you want. You want to know if the shapes are different. You can do all the hypothesis tests that you might, that you might dream up, okay? Um, so we solved the first two. What I didn't tell you yet is how reliable your model is given a different distribution of classes, right? So I told you a good solution would solve all those three. Don't worry, I, I'm going to keep my promises. So here what we did is we subsampled randomly from our test set. You don't actually have to subsample randomly. For example, if I sampled with an inverse probability, I'm going to get a uniform distribution of classes, right? In which case, basically what I'm saying is in my error estimate, I'm, it's equally important to me whatever class happens to be, yeah? Now that's clearly not what's going to be like in the real world, right? I mean, we're not going to have necessarily equal distribution of classes, but for me, I don't care if a cat only appears one out of 10 times. I want to be as wrong with cats as I am with dogs. But we can have, because we don't know this is also in the real world, we can also treat the probability of a class appearing as a random variable, right? As I said before. So what does it mean? We can sample with a random probability, and how would we do that? Well, just an off-the-cuff suggestion, look at your classes, right? Say which one is the rarest, okay? Calculate what the binomial variance is of that appearing. So if you have a probability of appearing of, let's say, 0.1% or whatever, 1% uh, of 1%, so then the variance is 10%. And now you can jitter your probabilities when you select for each subsample by that 10%. Because you can expect that that's going to be more or less how your classes are going to vary. See? And now it's going to give you a much better estimate of what you'd expect it to, because the test sample is only one sample, but you know the lowest the lowest uh, uh, likely has the highest uh, binomial probability. And so what you can do is you can take, basically what you're doing is you're saying, well, the odds of selecting a particular class also varies. And how does it vary? Well, it varies with the most variant of my classes. Yeah? So that's another little, like a, a trick where you can add it. So if you're really not sure that my test set is representative of the class balance I'm going to see in reality, for the very large industrial test sets, you might not necessarily need that. Or for a model where you don't care, uh, you, you, don't, you want your most uh, uh, frequent class 
to be the best, then maybe you don't really care that you're more wrong on the 10%, right? So that's basically it. That's the whole, that's the whole algorithm. And in that case, we really solved you know, all three of these issues. Um, so quickly, what did we do? Well, even though you can't bootstrap and cross-validate, uh, you could still estimate the errors, yeah? By adding the noise from the derived train and subsampling and then doing these, these subsample bootstraps rather than the bootstrap with replacement, and this way you can get a kind of judgment on your models, which one you should choose, okay? So that's what we succeeded in doing. So I mentioned there's even a better solution as a bonus, but it's a 25 minute talk, it's the last one, and I know doing math as your last few slides is not a good idea. So I'm just gonna simply point out some problems with my solution. So you don't think that I'm in denial and think it's actually the perfect uh, uh, thing. So one, we don't deal with very, with very big overfitting of our data, either to the fact that we're all training to the same, we're all testing on the same test sets, or that our training set is not representative and because we can't cross validate, we're not really sure. Uh, maybe with regularization or other techniques you can have some idea, but we don't really deal when I estimate with the error that how overfit my model is. We don't deal with something like extremely imbalanced classes, classes that appear very, very, very rarely. Why? Because unless you do a lot of iterations, you might not sample those very, very rare classes, right? So then you end up in the same problem that you had. Why can't you cross, can't cross validate or can't bootstrap? Well, if I need to do 10 million bootstraps, I'm in the same problem that I was before. Uh, and the other thing is, there is an upward bias to our error estimates. We're, we're, we're saying where there's more error than there is. That's for uh, a statistical reason, which I'm not going to prove to you, but subsampling uh, is, is, is upward bias in the error estimates. Um, anyway, that's, that's a whole other discussion, but if you want to know why, we can talk about it after. And, uh, and oops. The other thing is, um, we made a little mistake. What did we do? We added a random noise, right? But many models count on the fact that there are between feature correlations. So for example, if you were a decision tree, you might say, well, if X is greater than 10 and Y is less than three, well, then it's really a bot, not a human traffic, for example, right? So in that case, in that case we're breaking or we're lowering the, the correlation. So you would, need to, to, you would need to also deal with the covariance, right? So that's, this model didn't help you there, right? But overestimating your error is generally not such a bad thing. Right? I'd rather say that I'm more wrong and actually be right more than I said than the opposite, right? Which is... Sorry? You might choose the wrong model because there is one more model that is more sensitive to those... That's absolutely true. It's absolutely this true. This is why your random forest data... Right. For example. Right. Um, so yes, so you have to deal with covariance. So my solution isn't perfect and there's more stuff that we can do. And if you're really interested to hear how you can make it even better and you don't mind listening to some math, uh, come up afterwards and I'll show you some hidden slides. Okay. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so the question was what helped me come up with those ideas? Uh, honestly, it was, it was mostly an observation that, there, that, we, that we just keep giving these single numbers and I didn't understand how you could say something's better from a single number. I mean, I, I don't know, what's the expectation on a single number? You know, it's, it's like a gambler's dilemma kind of problem, so it, it seemed like there had to be some way to estimate. Well, get, what, one of the things that made, gave me the idea, there was a uh, paper by Efron, who was the guy who invented the bootstrap uh, from Stanford, who was like 90-something and still writing papers. So he wrote this, um, he wrote this kind of article about uh, um, this bootstrap, which he calls the 632 plus bootstrap, I don't know if you ever heard of this, but the idea is basically that when you, when you resample, you have a chances of resampling that go, well, anyway, that when you take a, the limit of your, of, your, of your test set to infinity, it goes to one over E, which is uh, 0.328, so 0.632. So he weights, his, he weights the bootstrapping in such a way as to deal with the upward bias. And when I thought about him doing this bootstrap, uh, I thought, ah, oh, well, actually, you could do that just for estimating the error on the test set. So that's one inspiration. Uh, I don't remember the other authors, but if you look at the latest Efron or one of the latest Efron papers. Got it. So the question was, uh, why use uh, uh, subsampling versus resampling, right? Uh, that was the first question. And the second question is, well, what about using things like Smote or uh, any of these kind of under oversampling things? So uh, I'll answer the second question first. Second question is about training. 
you would use Smote, for example, on your training set if you wanted to balance, if you wanted to more, if you wanted to get a more uh, balanced estimate of your, uh, if you wanted your model to deal with uh, class imbalances. For the augmentation that you do in the end, you do some kind of data augmentation, and the problem, as someone mentioned here, is that you ruin the covariance between features because, because you add random noise. But if right. you would use in Smote when you do augmentation, you use like. A, Averages, averages from different samples, and then you somehow make. Yeah, but SMOD is about is about class balance, uh, and yeah, here I'm not. What you do in SMOD and application is create the data points. So mm. what I'm asking is why not creating the new data points in this space? It's it's. A, I mean, what you're basically saying is instead of doing uh, resampling or subsampling at all, uh, you use uh, uh, use SMOD to augment your test set, and then. In the the one of my, I mean, you could you could essentially do this where you would then you, you end up in a situation where you need to now uh, uh, add randomized parameters to smote, right? Meaning the idea is that I want a histogram in the end. I don't want a single number. So if I just augment my test set once, uh, I end up with another single number. I add another point estimate. So I I need a way to estimate the variance on this point estimate. Yeah, no, so, I, I, I meant to just do it various times, like you do it. Well, Smote would give me the same result if I used the same random kernel, right? So so then it's still a point estimate. So that's the reason I wouldn't do it. Also, Smote is generally a, a thing that you would do in training rather than test. Um, but but uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe it's an idea. Instead of resampling, you could do, uh, instead of resampling or subsampling, use another algorithm like Rose or Smote or one of those. So why did I subsample instead of resample? It's a very good question. So uh, uh, I subsampled instead of resampling because I was trying to simulate what test taking a test set actually is. A test set is a subsample of reality, right? And so what I want to do is say, well, if the test set, let's say, were a truly random subsample of reality, what I want to do is estimate what's going to happen if I subsample the subsample. Yeah, there's advantages. Resampling would be would be better if I wanted to estimate. Well, it's a whole other statistical discussion, but but resampling. If I want to estimate the variance on the uh, if I want to est estimate the variance on the point estimate, in this case, subsampling makes more sense than resampling. If I wanted to estimate uh, variance directly, rather rather than variance of the point estimate, then resampling would make more sense. But maybe we talk about it afterwards because it's kind of a yeah, there is. Yeah. About the noise adding. In your code, you should just add some random noise, but in the deep learning example, you have to augment the data similarly. How can you choose those parameters that are important in deep learning? Yeah. So, like everything in, in deep learning, it's sometimes more art than science, right? So, you'd have to choose, you'd have to choose your, your higher order things that you want to vary uh, smartly, right? And the better you choose them, the more estimate. The, be the better your estimate of your error is going to be. There's no perfect, you know, there's no, there's no uh, perfect solution, right? In any case, it's going to take some of your expertise, especially in, in deep learning where, for example, it's very domain specific, right? Like if I'm not talking about, if I'm talking about cats and dogs, right? I might care about background or average image brightness or other things that could perturb or, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, color of the fur or, or all sorts of things like that or size of the animal and perspective in the image, all sorts of things like this. But if I were talking about smile faces, you know, uh, or sad faces, then maybe the face orientation is much more important than how bright the image is, for example, up within certain normal bounds, right? So again, it requires domain knowledge. And no, I can tell you right now, no estimate of your error is actually going to be perfect, right? I mean, and for deep learning, again, or, or large neural networks that take a long time to train, you're never going to get, you know, the, the best way is bootstrap your training. But if you can't do that, then I'm just giving the next best. But you make a strong point. Yeah, but if the test set grows, then it uh, is this the uh, technique still effective? No. Then it make all the algorithms straight to the base point? No, so what you're saying is, in, no, so I'm, I'm still doing the subsampling and adding noise each time, right? Because I'm, what I'm doing is, for example, if I had, in my example of, uh, uh, maybe I can, yeah. So in this example, right, so what I did was I calculated the, the face angles and I looked at the variance in that, right? And I have a distribution now which has add zero to my face angle of a particular case uh, uh, on average, but occasionally with, according to the variance, pluck a number that's either positive or negative to, my, to each set. So what I'm doing is in each subsample, I'm adding this, this noise, 
essentially, right? So basically, instead of calling this function, okay, just add, select a random number, I would select a random number and then have an additional line of code that says, you know, warp my image by turning it from that with that number. Yeah. So yes, it's more work with neural networks. It's uh, yeah, but the, but the code is still very simple, right? Because you would just, you know, you you think of a few higher order parameters that you know your network is is a. Uh, 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 is a, a not robust to, and those are the ones you want to mess around with to find out how how perturbable it is. Do you find these um, these features uh, in deep uh, layers of the net sometimes? Yeah. So, but th then again, we're going back to the training problem, right? So, I you, what you're saying is okay. So, take my training, take my training, look at what the weights are after the training is completed, and then try to find out. Let's say the nodes. Like the higher, the, 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 the deeper nodes are responding to higher order features. And so maybe those will give me a hint on which features I could perturb. That's, 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 yeah, why not? But then, yeah, I mean, it won't, it will, you will be in a problem though, if again, if you're very overfit or your, or your data set isn't large enough or all sorts of other issues that I didn't talk about in this talk. But in general, yeah, that's a good suggestion for maybe getting at which, which things you could be robust to. Okay, so that's it for now. Anyone who's more interested in math, thanks.